All right, everybody, we're going to get started. I know there's a couple coming over from the ADOM meeting, uh, the ADOM webinar with Teresa, but I just want to uh, get us started and they can join in. And remember, the replay is available in the uh, Dental Insurance Billing and Coding Academy group. And it will also be on our YouTube channel, which I'll post a link to in the description on the group. So let's let's get started for everybody that was with us on uh, Tuesday. Just want to say, you know, thank you for hanging in. Thank you for taking the time to improve yourself and improve your your knowledge during the mandated shutdowns. And, you know, again, please, as before, feel free to answer any questions. I do have the, the questions tab popped up and we are watching for them. So please feel free to answer any questions and I will answer them as time permits. So <laughs> with that said, let's get started. Um, you know, again, this is part two. We're gonna get more into EOBs. We're gonna get more into specific rules, adjustments, so on and so forth. Um, as well as perio charting or uh, perio billing and what's required and, and the proper process for that, which is always a big, big question. So with that said, again, let's, let's get started here. We'll hop right into reading EOBs. So the EOB that you see on the screen right now is a sample EOB from Delta Dental. This is the one that they provide on their website. There are a couple things that I, I love about it and a couple things that I'm not a fan of, but let's, let's kind of walk through for everybody who has seen an EOB before and hopefully all of you have. Let's walk through this. Um, you will see, and let me just pull up my drawing here. You will see on a normal EOB, there's a couple different sections. There's the date of service naturally, tooth numbers and services for each procedure, the procedure codes themselves, and then you have your submitted amount, which is your full fee. Okay, the ADA says if you are using their claim form, which we all are, that when you submit a claim to an insurance company, you should, should be submitting the full fee regardless of any negotiated discount. So what that means is this. Take your in-network participation status away and the fee that you would charge that patient if they did not have insurance is the fee that you submit here, that you submit on the claim form to the insurance company. That's your full fee, or it should be your full fee. I don't want to get into discounts, um, <laughs> you know, given we all know that waiving copays and deductibles is considered overbilling, but also overbilling is if you give every cash patient a 10% discount, say a crown is a thousand, you give a cash patient a 10% discount, take it down to 900, but you continue to submit $1,000 on the claim forms to insurance companies, you are overbilling the insurance companies. Even if they're only gonna pay you 752 because of your negotiated discount, you are still overbilling the insurance companies. So you know, please don't do that. That's a, that's a different class, that's a different thing, but something else we'll talk about. So then on the EOB, the next thing that you see is the contract allowed fee. I love how on um, Delta sample EOB, they put that the uh, contract amount and the submitted amount are exactly the same. That almost never happens that the insurance company allows your full fee. But in their example, that's what they're giving. Deductibles, if they apply, which we are going to talk about. Copay percentages, which we all hopefully know what they are. Um, and what the patient's balance is and what Delta's payment total. If there's any special codes, they put those and you see 
that code links down to here that says coverage for this procedure is subject to a contractual frequency or interval interval limitation. So <laughs> for that perio maintenance, you obviously went over the frequency limitation on that, which we typically will if we're doing three or four of those in a year. Um, that's just normal and that's going to happen. So let me close out of there and let's go on to the next one. We'll get into actual EOBs from actual insurance companies. So this one is pretty simple. This is for a filling, a two surface composite filling done on a patient. So again, you see here, all right, 2392 is the code that was done. Let me just pull my drawings back up here. 2392 is the code that was done. That's that two surface composite filling. You submitted $241. That's your full fee, a patient without insurance. That's what they pay, $241. The allowed fee is $170. That's your fee schedule price. That's your negotiated fee for that service with the insurance company, which means you have to do a $71 write-off. The patient in this example has a $50 deductible with 80% coverage, Delta paid 96, and the patient owes 74. So real quick, let's just walk through um, all of that math so everybody kind of understands it. So again, remember the full fee, your full fee, is $241. The allowed fee is 170, which means you have to do a write-off of $71. 241 minus 71 equals $170. That's the allowed fee. That's what they're paying. They have a $50 deductible and they have 80% coverage for this filling. So 241 minus the 71 write-off to allowed fee gives you a 170 or $71 write-off, gives you a $170 allowed fee. $170 allowed fee minus the patient's $50 deductible gives you a $120 remaining balance. That $120 remaining balance after the deductible is paid is what the percentages are based on. I am amazed at how many people who have been in dentistry for years and years and years don't understand that if there's a deductible to be paid, that comes off of the allowed fee, and then the percentage for coverage, which in this case is 80%, is multiplied after the deductible is removed. So we take that $120 remaining balance, multiply it by 0.8, 80% coverage paid by the insurance company, that's a $96 insurance payment with a $24 patient balance plus the $50 deductible that is a patient balance, which says $74 is due from the patient, $96 will be paid by the insurance company, and we're good to go. So hopefully that makes sense. If there are any questions, again, please do not hesitate to ask but that is the way that process works. We take the $96 insurance payment, we add the $74 patient balance, $50 deductible, $24 copay, $170 is what's paid total between the two, and that equals the allowed fee of $170 per the fee schedule with that patient. <coughs> Excuse me. So. The next EOB we have here isn't really an EOB, but it's something that is very, very important, I feel, to talk about, which is requests for more information. Okay, when we are submitting claims for our clients, one of the things that we are constantly addressing on their outstanding claims report is insurance companies that requested more information and never got a reply. 
This is huge. This represents in some offices a very large percentage of their outstanding insurance claims and is something that you have to pay attention to. So in this case, we build out for a full upper denture. They are looking for the date of prior placement and the reason for the replacement. Obviously, it was indicated on the claim form. Somebody indicated that this was a replacement prosthetic, but they never gave the date of the original placement and they never gave the reason for the replacement being required. Even if it is within a certain or outside of the allowed time frame, you know, we know that insurance companies have replacement rules that could be anywhere from oh, three to now almost 10 years for replacement of a denture, a partial, a crown, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> if we don't meet the required reason for replacement, they still will not or don't have to pay for it. So just saying, well, the patient lost it may not be a covered reason. You have to read the agreement between the patient and the insurance company, read their contract, which is basically the nice way of saying, know their plan specifics and make sure you know in what circumstances will a replacement prosthetic be covered. It being lost or being broken or the dog chewed it may not be covered. It may need to be something that is medically necessary, such as poor fit, unable to do adjustments, unable to reline, unable to this because of you know, the age or the material, whatever it may be. <laughs> so you wanna make sure when you are submitting your claims, you are giving all that information possible. What this now will do <laughs> is delay them paying for this full denture until that information is received. And once that information is received, that 30 day, 45 day clock starts again for them to process that claim. So you can actually be slowing down your cash flow or losing money if you miss one of these or you don't get one of these or you, you, know, you see it, you put it on your desk to follow up with and you never do. These can sit and many, many insurance companies have timely filing requirements that include requests for additional information. So you know, there are some insurance companies that have a 90 day timely filing. So you could get this letter in the mail from Guardian you put it off to the side, you forget about it, you find it four months later, well, guess what? You just did that denture for free if you are in network because you can't charge the patient because you failed to respond to a request and they don't have to pay you because it's outside of their timely filing requirements. So these do apply as well. So you know, please, please, please make sure you are paying attention to these and you're getting them responded to quickly. Best practice is to always, always make sure you submit this information with the original claim. Okay. <laughs> um, just for those of you that were on the ADOM webinar with Teresa Duncan, that was an hour and a half ago, it started. One of the things she said was insurance companies are moving away from narratives and are beginning to want screenshots of clinical notes. Okay, this is something we have been doing for the past five or six years with our clients is submitting all, not a narrative, we're not writing a separate narrative. We are submitting a screenshot of the chart note for the day you did the crown because your chart note should say, did a crown <laughs> because of a fracture on a distal wall, or because of this, or because of a missing cusp. I'm gonna take a drink here, give me one second. Excuse me. And you want to have all of that information in the chart note, so you can explain clinically why you did what you did. And that is what insurance companies are starting to want instead of a handwritten narrative or a, a typed out narrative. They've caught on, <coughs> excuse me, 
They've caught on. They know that the doctors are not the ones writing the narratives. And that's not okay with them because it never should have been okay, to be quite honest. The narrative should be coming from the dentist. So now insurance companies are beginning to move towards wanting chart notes, screenshots of the chart notes in place of a separately written narrative. Again, <laughs> we've been doing that for the past five years for our clients. We have never had a problem. We have never had a delayed payment because of that. It's just the way it should be done. But in that chart note, you should include all of this information. Why you're redoing this denture. What was the initial date of placement, if you have it, if not as close as possible. Um, you know, some, <laughs> some patients won't know. They'll say, oh, this denture is 15 years old. I don't know, I got it in, you know, 2005 sometime. Well, put, you know, patient doesn't know an original data placement exact. It was, you know, estimated to be second quarter of 2005. That will get them close enough if your reason for replacement also matches up and is a payable event for them. So the next one here, this is a pretty simple one, but it brings us into my next few comments. So for this one, as you see, um, this is obviously a MetLife EOB. They paid the, the pulpal debridement as normal, you know, deductible was applied, <laughs> it's a $48 allowed fee, they have a $50 deductible, 80% coverage, but the $50 deductible doesn't cover the $48 allowed fee, so the patient pays that in full. Now, <laughs> the nitrous. This is what causes a lot of confusion for people, okay? You see where it says, nitrous is not a covered expense. Right there, not a covered expense. But your full fee is $53. The negotiated fee is $38. So the question is, if this is not a covered expense, and this is what people will say, it's a non-covered service, I get to charge my $53. Why is the insurance company telling me I can only charge 38? It's not covered, therefore they don't get to dictate that rule. Well, in most cases, <laughs> you are partially correct. There are 14 states that do not have a non-covered services law. In those 14 states, the insurance companies make the rules. Now, <laughs> here is the listing of all the states that do have one. So take a minute, look that over, see if your state is on there. If your state is not on that list, your state does not have a non-covered services law, which means the insurance company gets to make the rules themselves. The rules are up to the insurance company. They have nothing to do with what you want or what you think is right or what's happening in Pennsylvania or what's happening in North Dakota. None of that matters. <laughs> what matters is what the insurance company says on the EOB in those 14 states. In these remaining 36 states, each state has a different non-covered services rule. In the group, as a comment on this video, once it's posted and is live in the, in the Facebook group, I will post a link to the list of all of these 36 non-covered services rules that are state by state. However, I can tell you, 35 of the 36 <laughs> say that there is a difference between covered and non-covered, but there is also a difference between non-covered and non-payable. And the vast majority of those 
follow what we call the never ever rule. Okay. The never ever rule goes just like this. If it is a service that would never ever be covered by that plan, it is considered non-covered. If it is a service that would be payable, except there's a waiting period, there's an annual maximum, there's a frequency limitation, there's an age limitation, then it's non-payable. It's still a covered service, but it is not a payable service. So the patient pays the insurance allowed fee, the fee schedule price for that service. So does that, you know, hopefully that makes sense for everybody. Um, so let's, let's go into an example here. Let's say you are doing fluoride on a 45-year-old person who has a plan that does cover fluoride for everyone who is under the age of 14, but does not cover fluoride for somebody who is 45 years old. That patient in those 35 states will pay the insurance allowed fee not your full fee. Okay, so if you charge $30 but insurance allows 15, that 45 year old who does not have adult fluoride coverage but their plan does cover fluoride for a 12 year old, they pay the $15, they pay the allowed fee, they do not pay your full $30 fee because there is coverage but it is subject to an age limitation. What about when a patient maxes out? What about when a patient reaches their annual maximum? They've spent their $1,000 or $1,500 annual max, and now they still need two more crowns because they hit their max in August and they, I don't know, bit into a Jolly Rancher and it broke two of their teeth. You have two teeth with a missing cusp. You're now gonna do two crowns. The patient's maxed out. They would have coverage if it were not for a contractual restriction, the annual maximum. So that patient pays the insurance allowed fee, the fee schedule price. They do not pay your full fee. And that is in 49 of the 50 states. Because remember, there are 14 that don't have a non covered services rule. There are 35 that have one that reads exactly like this. And then there is one that has a rule that says, if insurance doesn't make a payment towards the benefit, they cannot dictate the price. I'm not gonna tell you which state that is yet, but I'll post it in the comments of the, of the replay video. And you know, see if anybody can guess. In the in the comments of the replay video, go ahead and, and guess what state you think it is. And then after a few hours, I'll go on and uh, post what the answer is. But I can tell you it's probably not the one everybody thinks it is. And hopefully if you're in this state, you know the rule. So <laughs> that is there. Um, Somebody did ask, can you send a picture of the tooth? In, in which example? Do another question and tell me which, which thing you're asking about a picture of the tooth for. Um, I tell everybody in, in most cases when you're doing a, any submission, I want to have all the required and unrequired backup that's possible. So, you know, I'm not sure... When you say, can you send a picture of the tooth? Are you asking if you can send that instead of a narrative? No, no, you cannot. They're gonna want that narrative. They're gonna want the chart notes, the doctor's notes, no matter what. But when I submit a claim for a crown with a buildup, I do picture and x-ray before the prep, before the buildup. I do a pre-op, pre-buildup picture. I do a post buildup picture 
and then I do the, the crown seat pictures and x-rays as well. Your intraoral camera, when it comes to getting things paid, can be your best friend. It's something I think every office has. You absolutely should have one. You should have one in every operatory, and you should be using them all the time. Uh, we just got another question that I do want to kind of answer as we go, if I can. If a patient has hit their annual maximum, do you have to submit the claim to the insurance company even if you expect a $0 payment? If you are in network with that insurance company, yes, you do. You signed a contract stating that you would submit claims for all procedures done on all of that insurance company's patients, no matter what. So even if you know <laughs> it is a non-covered service, Let's say you have a patient that has one of the AARP preventative only plans. All they're gonna cover is two exams, two profies, and maybe one set of bite wings a year, and that is it. Everything else there is no coverage for. It is 100% preventative only, the cheap AARP plan. If you do a crown or a filling or a bridge or a partial on any one of those patients, you still submit the claim form. If you are in network, you agreed to that in your contract. You can't get around it. And if they do an audit, which again, the chances are slim, but in my personal opinion, I do think we are gonna see many, many, many more audits after the COVID-19 outbreak is over. Um, insurance companies are gonna be looking for any way possible to save money to eliminate expenses, to reduce overhead, just like we are. And I think we should be prepared for an increase in the number of audits being done for dental offices. If that gets caught in an audit, you have violated the contract and they're gonna request every penny they have paid you as an in-network provider back as of the date of the infraction. So, you know, please, 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 please know the rules. It is so important for everybody to know those rules. You know, pay attention to them, understand them. All right. So we got, whoa, my goodness, zoomed right through. So non-covered versus non-payable. Hopefully everybody got that. Everybody understands. If you do have a question, please, please, please feel free to ask. Type them in the questions section, uh, the question and answer box if you have it. Type it in the chat and we will, we will get it. Um, so somebody else asked, if they do not pay towards treatment like a crown, does it count towards frequency limitation? For some insurance companies, it will. For some, it will not. You have to know for the insurance companies. I can tell you most of the deltas, it will not. Some of the smaller insurance companies, it will. Um, a lot of the union type plans, it will. Um, and United Concordia, it will. So if you do a crown on a tooth that has a crown, you do a replacement, it's a year before the five-year resets. You submit it, which you are required to do if you are in network, that restarts the five-year replacement rule on that tooth on that crown. So it varies by insurance company. Most of them are no but there are some, and I will say it is growing, um, there are some that, yes, it will. It will affect their frequency limit. So I've seen many, many times we submit for an exam, it's not covered because of a frequency limitation, but then the plan has switched from two per 12 months to two per calendar year, and they go, hey, you already did two this calendar year because of that first one you submitted that wasn't covered. It, it, it's happening more and more. So let's get into coding, coding to increase your profits and coding so that you understand 
why we do what we do. So we all know there are frequency limitations for exams. Example, two per calendar year, two per floating 12 months, one every six months. Okay, they all mean different things. On the insurance verification form that is posted in the group, in the group files, and that we talked about on Tuesday in the last webinar, one of the things you see on there is exam frequencies. Is it two per year or two per 12 months? And do they have to be six months apart? There's a difference. Two per year means two per calendar year. So you could have one exam on December 31st and another one on January 1st, and <laughs> there's no frequency limitation involved there whatsoever because it is a different year. With that said, if it is two per 12 months, that means they can have two exams in any 12 month period. So if you have a patient come in in July, you do an exam. They come back in January, you do another exam. Now they come back in March because they have an emergency and you do a limited exam, you do a DO 140. That DO 140 is not going to be covered because that patient had an exam in July and then in January, and then again in March, that's three in any 12 month period. It is not going to be covered. Most insurance companies have those frequency limitations for exams. So what do you do? When you can use the 9110 code, okay? This is <laughs> the best code that you can possibly use instead of doing a DO 140, instead of doing a limited exam, use the 9110, okay? It's an emergency code, it's, it's in there. It tells you it's an emergency, do the palliative treatment. Now, you can use this in limited circumstances, but when you can, you should be using it. Okay, so when can you use it? When you don't, do anything other than the exam and take an x-ray or two if the patient is in pain. Okay, the actual definition of the palliative treatment is palliative treatment of dental pain minor procedure. So what that means is if you did something minor that there is no other code for, like smoothing a rough spot or you know, doing, even some insurance companies will consider a pulpotomy as a palliative and, and pay you based on the palliative instead of a pulpotomy if you're not completing the root canal. Anything you did to get the patient out of pain would be considered a palliative treatment. So if a patient comes in, you take a look, they, they have an abscess and you're gonna do a pulpotomy. You're gonna pop the tooth, get them out of pain, okay? And then refer them out for the root canal. You can bill out the pulpotomy, which is really what you should do, or you can bill out the 9110, the palliative treatment. Okay, understand that many insurance companies will downgrade a pulpotomy to a, pro, to a uh, palliative treatment. So you wanna just be prepared for that and know that. If a patient comes in, they're in pain, you do something to alleviate the pain with no definitive treatment. Okay, you can't do a palliative and a filling on the same day. You can't do a palliative and a crown buildup or a palliative and a root canal on the same day. You can't. But if they come in, they have a rough spot, they're in pain, maybe they have a, a little chip, and it's, it's causing them pain or they can't stop their tongue from rubbing up against it, which is irritating their tongue. You smooth it off, it's a palliative treatment. Okay, you can bill out the palliative and x-rays, but that is it. The minute you bill out any further treatment, the palliative is now going to be denied. But when you can, 
when it meets the criteria, bill for a palliative. It doesn't share exam frequency, I will say 99.9% .9 of the time. I think last year we did oh, like 106,000 plans we verified. And I think there were three that palliative did share with an exam. Um, three plans out of 106,000 plans. So it doesn't happen often, very, very rarely, doesn't share an exam frequency. So when you can bill for this, when what you're doing meets the criteria, please bill for it. So one of the other big questions that people will post, and you know, I belong to all of the Facebook groups out there, and one of the big ones that people post is, what's the code, what do you bill out when a patient comes in for an SRP, when a patient comes in for a scaling, and you do the six month, or the six week, sorry, the six week follow up, what do you bill out? The right thing to bill out is a D0171. That is a post-op evaluation. So what that means is if you do a procedure on a patient and you're bringing them back two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, six weeks later to check on the status of that procedure, check healing, you know, do a fine scale, whatever it may be, if it is post-op, is it after another procedure follow-up visit, it is a D0171 and it is typically considered inclusive of the original procedure. Okay, I don't know very many plans at all that will pay for this in addition to the scaling. They will say when you submit this, they wanna know what was the date of service and the original procedure for which this is a follow-up. And they will tell you this is inclusive of the scaling and root planing, okay? Billing out, and I will tell you this, and you know we're gonna talk about perio towards the end, um, but I will tell you, I am not somebody who bills out four quads of scaling and then brings the patient back six weeks later for a profi or for a perio maintenance. That fine scale, that polish is inclusive of the scaling and root planing. Even though it's not included in the definition, it's inclusive. I mean, I, I will tell you, so many dentists have gotten to where they are, are nickel and diming patients because you know, in their defense, the insurance companies are cutting their benefits, cutting their reimbursements. Costs are going up, reimbursements are going down, and it's very, very difficult to make a living with the current state of dentistry. Well, you know, I think it's going to get worse before it gets better but we still have to do the right thing for our patients. And in this case, after a procedure is done, you bring that patient back for a reevaluation. You know, if it's a, a extraction and you did sutures and you're bringing them back to check healing, guess what? It's a post-operative visit. It's a DO-171 and it's included in the fee for the extraction that you build out already. So, x-ray limitations. This is a big one. I have one client that we just brought on, oh, a few months ago, who, over the course of one year, lost $26,000 because x-rays were being collapsed. Okay, and that happens when the total cost of the x-rays you take today is more than the cost of an FMX, they're going to collapse the x-rays into an FMX. So, what exactly does that mean? What that means is this. 
let's say you take a panoramic x-ray and three PAs on a patient. The pano is $82. Your first PA is 17, your second is 12, your third is 12. That's a total x-ray expense of $123. Then, example two, you take a pano and four bite wings, $82, $53. Total X-Bay expense is $135. Example number three, four bite wings, three PAs, the first and second and third PA, 53, 17, 12, and 12. Total expense, $94. But, what happens when the insurance company allows $92 for an FMX? In example one, we build out $123 worth of x-rays. In example two, we build out $135 worth of x-rays. And in example three, we build out $94 worth of x-rays. All of them collapse to an FMX. The insurance company will pay you as an FMX and if the patient is not eligible because of a three, five, or seven year waiting period in between full mouth pano x-rays, it will be denied and the patient becomes responsible 100%. Okay, here, here's where I have an issue with this. I understand dentists need certain x-rays to properly diagnose a patient. If it is a new patient walking in the door, I get it. You're going to probably want an FMX. Some offices take an FMX and a pano, depending on age and wisdom teeth and so on and so forth. Uh, I get it. Um, there are insurance companies, and actually, Cindy, um, you're kind of leading me into what I was going to say next. Cindy says, why is United Concordia disallowing x-rays at a recall appointment? They only pay if it's necessary. That's not in the best interest of the patient. Here's why. Because too many dentists are taking too many x-rays when they aren't necessary just because they're allowed. I canceled our contracts with more than 10 clients last year because their standard policy was when we take four bite wings on a patient, we also take three PAs. That is not always necessary. Okay, we talked on Tuesday about risk-based plans. You have to take a risk-based approach to x-rays in dentistry. Just because insurance says you're allowed to take four bite wings every 12 months, if it's a patient, who is 42 years old, has never had a filling, has no periodontal disease, has amazing home care, everything is fantastic, their life is wonderful. Do you really need those four bite wings every 12 months or could you take them every 18? Okay, everything is going to risk based. And you know, we've all heard the saying, one bad apple spoils the bunch. Well, United Concordia, and they're not the only one, but United Concordia and other insurance companies now disallowing PAs if they're taken the same day as you do a DO120 is because too many dentists are taking too many x-rays too many times and they catch on. And then they have to make a rule that affects all of us because of the one or two or three bad apples who are abusing the system. Okay. <laughs> number one. Number two, you say they only pay if it's necessary. That's not in the best interest of the patient. Well, have you ever known any insurance company to do anything in the best interest of the patient? Because I haven't. If they were doing something in the best interest of the patient, insurance companies wouldn't have the same annual maximums today that they had when Nixon was president. It would have increased, it would have grown, something would have changed, but it hasn't. Remember, they are a business just like we are. 
we have to look at our numbers, they have to look at theirs. But, you know, just like we talked about on Tuesday, when, you know, one dentist is billing out a buildup with 100% of the crowns that they do, you know, in that case, they are over billing, they are over treating, and they are taking advantage of the situation or taking advantage of the patient and the insurance company. And the insurance companies caught on. So they make these rules that affect all of us to prevent the 10%, 15%, 30% of dentists out there who are billing incorrectly, illegally, and unethically. That affects us now because we have to, they have to protect themselves from those unethical dentists. And in order to do that, they have to make a blanket rule. That blanket rule rose out and it affects everybody. And that's the problem. But that's why we have these collapses now because too many people are billing out too many x-rays. You know, here's, here's what I'll tell you to do. If a patient comes in and they're due for a pano and they're due for bite wings, take the pano at their recall visit. If they're coming back two weeks later or three weeks later or four weeks later for a filling, for a crown, for, you know, they come in for an emergency visit, take the pano when they come in for that. You know, take a PA and a pano if it's a, an emergency visit. Take a pano when they come in to get their, their filling done after their recall visit when you took the four bite wings. Take the pano then or vice versa, what, whatever it may be. Split it up. If you split it up into different days, different appointments, they won't collapse it. You could take a pano and four bite wings if you do it over two appointments. So split it up if you need both. But the moral of the story here has to be take only what you need. And it is not a standard across the board. Every single patient that walks in the door needs four bite wings and three PAs. That can't be the way we look at things anymore. Okay, this, this, and I'm trying to avoid talking about it, but what we're going through right now, COVID-19, is going to change many, many, many things for a long, long time. Things are going to be different. Companies are going to be struggling. People are going to be unemployed. Okay, businesses are not going to be able to bring back 100% of their workforce. The unemployment rate is going to jump again. This is in my not humble opinion. Unemployment is going to jump. It is not going to go back to 2.9%. It is not going to go back to 3.25%. It's going to stay elevated. People are not going to have money. We have to to not be milking the system. And unfortunately, again, because of the few dentists who take advantage of the situation, take advantage of the allowance, that's why we now have the situation that we're in. So let's move on to our, our end kind of topic here. And you know, just so everybody knows, in addition to putting information out there and, and you know, hopefully helping some people to improve their habits and, and make you think about outstanding claims and what you're submitting, part of what I want to do with these webinars is create a platform for discussion. So you know, please go on to the Facebook group. Go on to the posts. Ask a question. Talk about something, start a discussion. That's what we're here for. And that's how we all learn and grow. So you know, please, please, please participate. So periodontal treatment planning. These are examples of perio patients, but does every perio patient that walk in your office look like this? I don't think they do. Some do. Some don't look like this. These are obvious cases, but there are many, many cases that aren't this advanced 
but still qualify as periodontal disease. So how do we handle them? And again, this is another big question that pops up in every group is how do we handle this? So here is the map. Here's how you handle it. Whether it is a new patient or an existing patient, when they walk in the door, they are immediately divided into one of two categories. Either you are able to perform a comprehensive evaluation or you are not able to perform a comprehensive evaluation. So let me ask you this. You see this patient on the right who has the, the wonderful bridges, all the buildup. Would you be able to properly perio chart that patient? Would you be able to properly perio chart this patient? No, you wouldn't. So what do you do? If you are not able to do a comprehensive evaluation, the only thing that you can do, oh, let me clear that out of there. The only thing you can do is a gross debridement to enable comprehensive evaluation. There's nothing else you can do. You can't do a prophy. You can't do a, 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 a scaling and root planing because in order to diagnose the need for scaling, one of the determining factors is periodontal charting. And if you can't get the periodontal charting because of buildup, you can't diagnose the need for scaling. So the only thing you can do is a 4355 gross debridement. That is it. If you can't do full mouth perio charting on a patient walking in the door, the only thing you can do is a 4355. Now, within that, there are two schools of thought. Do I do it with an exam or do I do it without an exam? Well, you can't do it with a comp exam, but you could do it with a DL 140 with a limited exam. However, bear in mind, that is going to trigger a frequency limitation. And this patient, as we all know, is going to be a regularly visiting patient. And he is, or she, is going to be using more than those two exams. So my personal thought you do the gross debridement, you bring them back for a DO 150 14 days later. I don't like to build DO 140s limited exams with a gross debridement. You can, you're certainly allowed to. There's no rule, there's nothing in the definition of the gross debridement to say you can't build a limited exam with it. However, I know this patient is going to be a regular patient. They're going to be in four or five, six times this year, I'm going to save those frequencies. I'm going to save those exam frequencies for later in the year. So I'm not going to do it, but there's nothing that says you can't. So you do the gross debridement. If you're unable to perform the comprehensive evaluation, they come back 14 days later. Now they're just like any other patient who I can do a comprehensive evaluation on. I'm gonna do my comprehensive evaluation, perio charting, physical exam, you know, extra oral, intra oral exam, so on and so forth, and they are gonna fall into one of four buckets. They are either going to be the finger of God reached down, touched their gums, they are healed up, they are healthy, they do not have periodontal disease, and you're doing a prophy. Or, and I really should switch the order of these, but I'll do that later. <laughs> the next one would be the 4346, which is scaling in the presence of gingivitis. We all know this. This code came out just a couple of years ago. There's still a lot of confusion surrounding it. It basically is the bloody prophy code that hygienists have been asking for for years. 4346, scaling in the presence of gingivitis. The patient does not have periodontal disease. 
However, they have gingivitis and I'm not able to do just a regular prophy, it's gonna be a little more involved. It may take a little longer. Insurance companies are paying this, the vast majority of them are paying this at the profi rate. So there's not a big difference in what you're getting paid, but you know, there is a difference in what you're doing and how you're how you're proceeding and how you're treating the patient. So the next bucket is the normal one. This is where I think the vast majority of those patients are gonna fall into. You're gonna be doing scaling and root planing on those patients, okay? They come back after the 14 days, you do the perio charting, they're fives and sixes, they have bone loss, attachment loss, so on and so forth, bleeding upon probing. You're gonna do scaling and root planing on them and they're gonna fall into the periodontal maintenance path from that point forward. Like I said, in my experience and opinion, that is where the vast majority of these returning patients are gonna fall into after a gross debridement, but it is not all, it is just some. Could be a prophy, could be 4346, the scaling in the presence of gingivitis. And the final bucket is you're going to refer them out to perio. If they are eights and nines and lots of sevens and all of the teeth are loose and mobility and it's just a terrible situation and not something you want to treat in office, refer it out to perio. So, you know, as we all know, most periodontists love to do implant placements. This is the time to start talking about, you know, all on fours, all on threes, whatever, whatever it may be. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, the periodontal map for treatment planning. This will get through, and I will tell you, this is what our clients follow, and we have no problems getting paid. We have no problems getting scalings play, paid because you have the proof, okay? Anytime you're doing anything periodontist, periodontal related, make sure you're taking pictures, okay? Those intraoral cameras are your friend and we are moving into a time where having evidence and having backup and having proof of why you did what you did are going to become increasingly important. Um, so, you know, please, 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 before and after pictures, before and after x-rays, um, you know, x-rays you don't have to do so many of, Use your camera, take, take those intraoral pictures. That, that they're better, better evidence in many cases. You can see things that you won't see on an x-ray. So, you know, please, please, please use the camera. Take as many pictures as you can. It doesn't hurt and it takes literally seconds to snap a couple pictures. So, any questions, please feel free to ask, ask in the group. Um, there was one question, somebody, somebody asked, does the DO-171 apply to visits to check bone density after a graft? Yes, it does. So yes, it absolutely does. You are doing a follow-up visit after a bone graft, after a procedure, the DO-171 is that code for a follow-up post-op exam. So you know, please, please, please thank you again for joining us. Um, you know, I had to promise a couple people I wouldn't run over because I do love to talk. So you know, go in the group, ask your questions, post your comments. I, I, my goal is involvement and expanding everyone's knowledge. So thank you again. Um, remember, next Tuesday. Next week, we're going to move away from insurance and we're going to get into thinking like a CEO or COO. Um, same thing, Tuesday and Thursday, two o'clock, both days, Eastern time. We're going to talk more about thinking like a COO, thinking like a CEO, and really looking at your office as a business instead of just as a practice. 
So thank you again. I hope to see you all again next week on Tuesday at two o'clock where we're gonna start thinking about treating our, our practice like a business. Have a great day and stay healthy.